So welcome to Guac is Extra, creative culture at its core. Thank you so much for tuning in on this beautiful evening. I'm your host, Stacey Sanchez, and I'm with today's featured artist. Uh, I'm Chris Richardson, but I, I go by Christopher Thomas Richardson. All right. And now, not to be confused with the American Idol singer, uh, but we'll get into that later. <laughs> right, um, right. So you've been working on music for 22 years. You've been a, a full-time English teacher at the college mm -hmm. for about six years. Uh, how do you handle that? How, how is it difficult to keep that balance between the two? Yeah, no, it, it definitely is. I, I think sometimes, you know, one suffers a little more and then the other one suffers a little bit more, you know, I mean, sometimes I'm able to balance them both really well, but yeah, they're, they're, they're you know, don't, don't tell my boss, you know, but yeah, right, <laughs> Some, right, sometimes, right. Uh, sometimes, sometimes the work suffers and sometimes the music suffers. Um, yeah. And sometimes, you know, like family life suffers or things don't get done around the house, you know, so it's, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a juggling act for sure. No, that does make sense. It's been very difficult um, for many musicians, um, despite, mm -hmm. you know, being a DJ, right? Um, and so, I mean, as far as your music, let's dive into that as well, too. Sure. Um, so you've been doing it for 22 years. Mm -hmm. um, how would you describe your type of music? I know you sent me uh, some music and, mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that kind of like spoke to me and I used it was trippy. Um, how, okay. how exactly do you, do you describe it yourself? What genre would that fit into to you if it does fit into a genre? I mean, it, uh, I think I think most of what I do and most of what I've been involved with is definitely electronic. But I, yeah, I'm I'm kind of all over the place. Uh, aside aside from that, um, I mean, for most for most of my music career, I was I was doing um, techno, and that's and that's what I would call it. But I kind of got a little sick of the music, and I kind of got a little sick of that scene. And so, yeah, within the last three years or so, I've been all over the place um, musically a bit, a bit more. So, um, yeah, I guess I've done stuff that would almost be like soundtrack music or atmospheric, ambient, down tempo, chill wave. Um, but I've al I've also had, you know, commissioned work where it wasn't exactly, you know, my go-to musical style so for, for the for the city of mist soundtrack that was more like mystery noir um you know kind of supposed to have like an older 1920s kind of vibe to it so I, i've done that as well and then there's also the um the independent film from the rgv called uh, redemption and that's a western so i worked with two other guys nice. um you know and we all kind of wrote and produced that together um, okay, so I worked on the Western song with Ray Perez and uh, Fred Dreffington, and um, and so it was a it was an independent Western film that was that was in the works, and then Corona came along, and, and so um, I think they're in the process of editing that now. Um, but we ended up making like the. The theme song, or you could call, you know, it was also like the trailer song for the for the teaser trailer. I guess they'll use it for the full full length tra trailer as well. But yeah, you know that that surprised me because I, you know, when I took the job, I was like, well, I, you know, I'll, I'll give it a shot. I, you know, and, and uh, I think it, it turned out pretty good. So I, I never thought I would make a western song. Correct. Um, so well, so. you know, and not to interrupt, but how does that work? I mean, you you do say as far as like your style is concerned, it's a lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's everywhere, so to speak, right? So it kind mm -hmm. of travels into various yeah. styles. Um, can we talk about that process for you? What was it like diving into what you would consider to be Western? Um, was it difficult for you to do that? Um, yeah, I think so. I, I did. I did some research, um, and, and I had a uh, I had a composition instructor, you know, tutor that was kind of helping me and coaching me through it. Um, so, so yeah, I got, I kind of got some outside advice and I did some research and stuff like that. Um, you know, also as a, when you, when you're a composer, like sampling can really help, you know, so I was, I was able to find some samples that kind of got me started and kind of gave the song that, that Western foundation. And then we kind of built on that from there. So, um, and then yeah, Ray, 
you know, did the guitar really well and did the vocal really well and it kind of fit. In some ways it was hard because I did, I did do a lot of research up front, but it, you know, once we got started, it came together easier than I thought. But I think, I don't, I don't think that's any testament to my skill. I think I just got lucky, you know, I, I think I have more skill in other genres, you know, so. But it was an opportunity for you to take advantage of and yeah, you did what you could yeah. in order to do it. Yeah, and and I'm still, you know, going to attempt to uh, score the the independent film as well. I don't I don't think it I don't think it'll be feature length, so that'll that'll make it easier. And I've never scored a full film before. I'm excited about that, and I'm excited to to try that. So, so when does this uh, film? I mean, do they have a designated the, date? No, they don't have a date so, yet. They're 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 editing it right now, so I don't know how much longer. So so, so yeah, everything's everything's already shot, and okay. and now they're they're editing all the footage, and and so I don't know how much longer they have. I haven't I haven't heard anything. So that was the last I heard about it was a week or two ago. Wow. So okay. They were still editing it. So the name of the of the film is called Redemption. Redemption. So Zach Rodriguez is the director for the film. Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. I, I have an upcoming release that doesn't have a solid release date just yet. He told me he'd, he'd get me the release date by the end of the week. So I, I, I'm having a uh, single on Black Vault recordings that will be out sometime uh, in September. Okay. And so that's, that is more techno again and dance music and stuff like that. Um, and I'll probably have some independent single releases that I'll just self-publish myself as well. Um, and I don't have any hard dates for that because I'm just I'm just now getting the masters done. So the mastering has just been done on those. And so I'm just now able, you know, I didn't want to set hard dates on that until the songs were mastered. Um, and I'm also in the middle of working on the City of Mist soundtrack volume two. So, but with that, again, I, I don't have a hard date set yet. I'm still working with the, um, with the creator of that game, you know, back and forth, making modifications to the, to the songs, you know, based on what he wants. So we're, we're still kind of in the, in the, in the process of the, the revisions, I guess. Oh, okay. So that's something to look forward to. I mean, are, are you currently just creating music on the sidelines at home? Yeah. Staying yeah. safe? Um, yeah, I do that. Um, I, I also... Uh, sometimes I do like reviews and okay. tutorials and stuff on my YouTube channel. Uh, I do little jam sessions on YouTube and Instagram and Facebook as well. I guess, yeah, I guess I put the I put the reviews and the tutorials and stuff on Instagram and Facebook okay. as well. So I know you and I had talked previously to this conversation um, on being able to manage yourself as an artist. Yeah. And despite the concept of, you know, you being a person and living a personal life, but at the same time, mm -hmm. it's also being able to manage the the part of marketing yourself as an artist and yeah, um, I, I can understand that can be a difficult um what are your thoughts on that and and where do you see things fitting a lot easier? oh okay so just yeah bit... i actually okay. have, yeah i've actually just read this within the last couple of weeks and so there you go uh it's helped me be a lot more organized and come compartmentalize everything Right. Uh, which is which is really helpful. I mean, I'm still implementing some of the stuff a little bit, so I you know I can't give it like a complete um, endorsement yet. But um, but yeah, it, it, I think it's it's really great at taking all the little things that are bouncing around in your head. You're like, oh, I have to do this, I have to do this, and I have yeah. to do that. You know, and a lot of people are like, oh, well, I just need to get organized. But it's it's like organization on another on another level to where you really get to clear all the stuff out of your brain you know you're kind of using like filing cabinets and folders as a second brain so then you can leave that second brain behind when you when you need to and when you need to have a clear head i'm really i'm really loving it so far so well that's good yeah no and and, and see and that's why um because even as a person for example like I know that I have my moments, well, especially with quarantine. I, I, if I had it before, if I struggled with it before, I never noticed it. And mm -hmm. now with quarantine, it's suddenly, it's like, wow, I have this, this overwhelming anxiety that mm -hmm. came out of, just for the sake of either being cooped up at home and still having to get things done, or maybe it's just the concept of overwhelming myself for the sake of so many things that I want to get done. And there aren't enough hours in the day. So, right, so that's just, 
me being just a yeah. person. Yeah, so imagine absolutely. adding to that component yeah. of somebody trying to market themselves as an artist, right? And so, um, yeah. you know, and so a lot of artists have gone out of their way to, to in, in, in your respect, you're doing what you need to do with self-help books. I'm a, I'm a strong believer in that as well. Um, but for those that feel, okay, you know what? I can't do both because there, there's not enough time or yeah. it's a little too overwhelming for me, then they'll reach out, you know, to others in order to help them with the marketing side of, of, yeah. of their art or their creativity. Yeah. So is that something that, um, I know you and I have been talking about it. Do you find it a lot easier now with the book? I know you just started, um, or do you still feel like it's very important for an artist to reach out to someone that could easily help them with the marketing side of things? Gosh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think I think having, you know, gurus or consultants, you know, is always helpful, especially at the beginning when there's there's just so much information out there right. and you have and you have a lot of self-doubt. So, you know, I'll, I'll still even though, you know, I consider myself somewhere between the intermediate and advanced level, you know, uh, on the music, I'll, I'll still take classes. Uh, on that, and definitely with the marketing stuff, yeah, I'm, 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 um, I'm doing consultants and consulting gurus as much as I can, and and reading a lot. But but yeah, when you when I when I've been reading and watching YouTube videos, there's just so much information, and sometimes that information conflicts. So I think I think it gives me some peace of mind just just to ask people who have a lot of experience on that and. See, see what they think and, and and also you know a book can't give give you like a a personal diagnosis you know so you right. could read a book on instagram marketing strategy but that's not the same as having an expert look at your instagram habits and your instagram wall and feed and descriptions and everything and kind of diagnose and say okay these are your biggest strengths and these are the things you really need to work on so um so i think yeah i think it's helpful Let's also talk about you representing yourself as a person. Normally, we have artists that represent themselves, we know, with an alias name. Mm -hmm. You, on, on the other hand, decided to just represent yourself with your personal name. Mm -hmm. uh, let, let's talk about the cons cons to that. Why did okay. you, or the pros and cons to that, why did you sure. decide to, to go sure. that route with, with just utilizing your name as opposed to having an alias? And then from there, let's also talk about uh, the cons to that uh, on, on behalf of people just, you know, confronting you and, and expecting to mm -hmm. to speak to an American Idol singer. Sure, sure. Um, I think when I was younger, a lot of the DJs that I really respected uh, used their real name. Okay. Um, so even though I don't really identify myself as a DJ anymore, I think that kind of just stuck. I, I guess there's just a certain professionalism. And so, and then it wasn't too long after I kind of, you know, quit DJing or at least took a break from DJing that I had to start considering, well, maybe I'm going to be a composer instead. You know, when I when I stopped making the up-tempo music and made the down-tempo music, the the album that I had uh, from, from 2018, which is called Lost and Found, um, it ended up sounding like a horror movie soundtrack, you know? So then I was like, oh, okay. Um, I guess maybe I'm going to be a composer and, you know, and composers don't, you know, for the most, I think there's a few exceptions, but for the most part, composers don't use uh, aliases, you know, and I also wanted, you know, people to be able to search for me, you know, if they are, if they already knew me, maybe, you know, they'd have a better chance of remembering my name, whereas as, you know, if they got to know me and I only told them my alias once, then then maybe the next day they don't remember my alias and then they, you know, and then they can't find. So um, that so that was easier. So the, the reason that I ended up having to um, extend my name, I used, I used to go by Chris Richardson. And then for a little while I went by Chris T. Richardson because T was my middle initial. Mm -hmm. But I didn't like the way that sounded because everybody would be like Christy, like the girl's name. Uh, you know, so so then I had so then I just did the full long name Christopher Thomas Richardson. I just made it. And um, in some cases that's unfortunate because it's uh, because it's too long. Um, <laughs> but it's the uh, it's the lesser of all the evils, you know. I don't I don't right. wanna be mistaken for the american idol star you know which I've, I've had a few little emails or messages of that before um, can we share that story a little bit yeah i mean you know the most memorable one was just just yeah there was this girl that was like oh my god are you 
Chris Richardson from American Idol? And I was just like, no. And she just didn't say anything at all. But yeah, and, and, and it, it happened, it definitely happened a lot more when he was on the show. I think that was the, you know, the peak of his uh, popularity. So, right. um, and also when I looked into it, there were, there were other DJs who were named Chris Richardson as well. So oh. it, it's, it's a fairly, common name. name at least in the in music uh, so. let's also switch gears a little bit um and let's talk about what's happening kind of around the world and how how <laughs> how things are happening within the dj scene I, I did want to bring up uh just because it recently did happen as far as your local news is concerned you know we recently lost a, a very dedicated he was very talented and supportive uh dj and producer in the rio grande valley his name was dj mike nice um, and he was very fond within the hip hop scene. Has there been any kind of fluctuation within the, the scene itself? Mm -hmm. Has his death affected the DJ scene, so to speak? How is this virus changing the game for DJs dipping into live sessions, for example, at venues? You know, some of them are handling it better than others, but yeah, they're, they're just doing, they're doing lives from their studio or lives from their bedroom or where, you know, wherever they have their, their uh, their home set up, and it seems like some of their fans, um, you know, depending on how popular they were before, um, seem to be enjoying. You know, so I th I think everybody's making the most of it. The DJs are making the most of it. The fans of the DJs are making the most of it. Some people are um, still donating. Um, right. You know, and a lot of the DJs are producers too. So, so you know, some of the things I've seen posted are that you know the DJs are. You know, the, the downside is they're not getting to play the gigs, but the upside Correct. is they're, they're getting more work done uh, as producers. And some of them, you know, get more uh, creative with their with their presentation or the visuals or the effects, you know, or the lighting of their uh, their home studio. So they'll DJ and they'll have, you know, like ravey lights and stuff like that in the, in the home studio. So, but yeah, for me personally, it, it hasn't really affected me that much because I've kind of, I guess, gotten a little, a little older and a little crankier and a little grumpier to where I'm like, oh, I don't, I don't, you know, that's part of why I kind of left the DJ scene. I didn't, I didn't want to, you know, be up until 2 a.m. anymore and, and then have to pack everything up and then that's, and then that's 2.30 and then I'm driving from McAllen to Harlingen so I get home at like 3.30, you know, and, and it, it just, it wasn't worth it to me and I, um, and I think I got a little bit jaded too because when I would when I would DJ, people were dancing, but they were only dancing long enough to take these selfie videos. Mm. You know, so it was like, well, if everybody is more interested in their phone, why don't I just stay home and I can and I can put everything on the socials and you know, it's like because it's almost like even though they were at the club, they didn't really want to be there. They just wanted to be seen at the club. Right. You know, they just wanted the the document for their for their social media and and so. I kind of thought that was kind of fake and um, because I'm older and crankier I really didn't want to be there you know I I, I I try to get up early and sometimes for my work I have to get up early you know so um, I think if I ever did play parties in the future I, I would prefer them to be daytime you know I just think the, the vibe is better the guys are less creepy during the day you know people get too wasted and the fights break out and you have to worry right. about things getting stolen when it's dark and you're kind of looking over your shoulder when you got you're dragging hundreds of dollars worth of gear you know um, and I've and I've seen some record labels like all day I dream I think is the name of it where they you know they've tried to create a better vibe and, and th that label only throws daytime parties so I've tried I've tried to get on that label before but I think I think it's it's you know the the guy Lee Burridge is so popular I'm sure he gets thousands of submissions that are hard to sift through so you know I might have to somehow figure out a way to get a relationship with him personally mm -hmm. um, in order to kind of have an in and, and get the networking but yeah the the daytime vibe and, and, and it's, it's a lot more you know, it's not that dark techno that I used to be into. That's, that's gritty and obscure. Um, the the Lee Burridge all day um, all day I dream kind of vibe is a lot more happy and sunny and cloudy and you know a little bit a little bit hippie maybe a little bit spiritual. You know, just just kind of celebration in the sunshine. So it's a lot more yeah friendlier and like, warmer and happier than the, than the stuff that I that I used to be into a little bit more. So you evolving as an artist obviously shows. Us, that there are still struggles despite um, the scary times that we're living in right now is that yeah. even you know as a DJ going out you still have to deal with 
you know, with those struggles of, of worrying about your equipment and then knowing yeah. that, you know, there are downsides to, you know, who's listening to your music, who's dancing to your music, is anyone even paying attention, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and then from there, it's, you know, I, I think at the very end of the day, what kind of, what are your goals, right? Are, is that mm -hmm. what you're looking to grasp? Is, are you looking to grasp more traction out in the scene, so to speak, you know, with, um, with, with I, those, or is it more online? I mean, I think it, I think it is more online for me at this stage because, uh -huh. um, yeah, I'm, mar I'm married and, and, I, and I have two children, so I'm, I'm juggling all that as well. And I have th and I have three dogs, and you, you know, so I'm yeah, I'm not I'm not in a position like when I was younger. I was like, oh yeah, well, you know, I want to tour the globe and and stuff like that. And now, yeah, I wouldn't want to gig anywhere, uh, at least especially not consistently. I you know maybe a one time thing here and there, but. But I, yeah, I wouldn't want to do gigs or tours anywhere further than like Austin on a on a consistent basis. You know, sometimes people will get residencies and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I don't I don't identify as much anymore as a DJ or even a you know live musician or, or live artist. You know, I could still do that, but it's. I, think, I feel like being a producer is my strong suit and I like that. Yeah, I also don't like the chaos. I mean, it's more, it's more exciting, you know, playing live in a way, but it's also, there's, it's, there's a, it's, a, it's a lot more anxiety. You know, um, somebody could spill their drink on your gear, which, you know, I mean, it's, it's two things. Your gear is ruined, but also the, the music stops, you know? So right. with, with, D, with DJing and stuff like that and a lot of the electronic styles there's a, there's a pressure to kind of keep going you know in one track transition into another a lot of venues they don't have a good separation between the audience and the dj Hi. where you know people might get into a fight right next to the gear yeah it's 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 sometimes it does feel like oh yeah I'm, you know I'm, I'm too old for that and i and i like I like staying at home in the studio, and also with with producing, I can I can do it again and again and again until I like the end result. You know, right. whereas with with DJing, you have to you have to nail it, and you have to get it right the first time, and and I usually do, you know, because I've practiced and everything. But it's it's still very stressful to to just nail it live. Whereas, yeah, I like I like being able to craft it um, until I until I feel like the product is finished. And so artists are still finding ways to stay creative and still be productive and if anything still be successful you know with their music if there wasn't a pandemic though do you feel that we're at a time in with technology where we can still be successful without having to go out and show face or do you still feel like there has to be a happy medium between both i think in most cases the answer is you can be successful without showing face i mean you know maybe you know, maybe being a DJ, you know, somebody could say, well, okay, that's inherently about playing to a crowd. And so for me, because I identify as a, as a producer first and foremost, yeah, I think there are some producers that, you know, that's, that's, that's what they do. You know, they live and eat and breathe in their studio. I think some producers are more dependent on session players and orchestral players and bringing, bringing in other people to play certain parts. Now, again, you know, some of that can be done online. You know, you could send a guitarist the files and say, okay, play this, play these parts that I've written. So technology does give us uh, a lot of options, but, um, you know, we're losing certain things from the face to face, but I think also, you know, they say uh, necessity is the mother of invention. So, you know, I think we're seeing advancements in the technology even faster than before because there, there's such a there's such a need for it and everybody's had to pivot. So um, as a professor, the educational tools uh, are ramping up and even even the tools to teach us the tools are ramping up. Right. You know, I, I think for, for a lot of creators, we, we can make do with, with just online. That it might require some... Some flexibility and learning a new skill set. I think I think some DJs just prefer uh, to stay off of the internet completely. But I think that's getting harder and harder every year. You know, regardless of the virus, it's kind of like if you're not on social media and have a following, people say, "Oh, well, then who who are you?" You know. So what is it? So Sophie Turner for Game of Thrones, the red mm -hmm. the redheaded one. Correct. You know, when she, when she was auditioning for that part. They, they basically said there was another girl who was equally good and had equal credentials, you know, like, and she auditioned equally, like everything else was equal. But Sophie Turner had more of a following on social media. So that's what, it, and, you know, when everything else was equal, that's what ended up tipping the scales. Really? You know? So, yeah. That's a fun fact. So, 
it gives you gives you the the edge in, in some cases like that maybe so and I think it's I think it's true for um, you know people trying to get on record labels as well it's like okay are are you active on social media are your followers you know fake or are they interacting with you you know fairly frequently so um, because they want to know that that you already have value you're already a known quantity and then you'll bring more traffic um, to the label it's a, you know and, and it's also kind of the metric on collaborations you know like people are more willing to collaborate with somebody else that's on their level as far as like followers um, which you know might be unfortunate but that it, it, you know it is what it is so. yeah are you a fan of black mirror are you familiar and the reason why I brought it up is because it reminded me of, of like how real things could be and how much we uh, you know as humans tend to take advantage of certain freedoms that we have you know social media decides to come into play and, and knowing how tied to our phones we are then you watch you know this episode off of black mirror and it shows you how bad things could be if we decided to embrace it fully what are the odds of us suddenly judging people off of how many likes they had or judging people because of how many uh, followers they had yeah so, mm -hmm. and, 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 yeah. and then on top of that, whether or not we would even get a job or we, we were fit for that job because of what type of following we had on social media. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I could easily it's, see things getting there, but well, I mean, that's why some people are back. so, yeah, some people are so great at, at faking it that they fool everyone until the last minute. Uh, there were, I think there was this rock band and he bought all these fake followers and he bought all these fake followers. And, and you know, so eventually somebody gave him this huge concert venue. Mm -hmm. And then nobody showed up, wow. you know, and it was just so, you know, there, there was all this money wasted and his, you know, his career was all wasted, you know, so it's, it's, so yeah, if you think you're, you're just, you know, buying the followers and that's going to help you eventually, yeah, you might be in a situation like that where, you know, they book a venue for you because you, you know, oh, he's so huge, you know, or she's so huge and then nobody shows up because all the followers are fake. Pretty so. terrifying. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, the truth always comes out. I'm a big believer in that yeah. as well. So yeah. You know, yeah. it is what it is, man. And you can only fake yeah. it so far. All right, so on a national level, we pay tribute to a legendary composer, orchestrator, and a conductor. He, uh, for them, for many movies, his name is N.U. Morricone, and he is responsible for 400 scores for cinema and for television. His skills have allowed him to to have be flexible with creativity in a wide range of styles. Um, and the reason why I bring this up is because I definitely want to talk about how you handle creativity with your own personal skill. Uh, and on top of that, what does it mean to you? What does creativity mean to me? Correct. Okay. Um, I mean, I think creativity means means making something new. You know, if it's if it's not new in some way, then then it, to me it's not creative. You know, so it, so it can it can be it can be a new spin on an old thing. It can be combining. One, you know, two or more old things in a, in a new way, but yeah, the result it, it, ha it has to have the word "new" in, the, in, the, in there somewhere. You know, you know, so the, so the opposite of, of of creativity is you know played out or same old, same old, right? So so again, you know, like those are those are the if you're not creative, then it's same old, same old. It has the word "old," right? So not creative is kind of old whereas creative is, is new and I, and I still think you know the best type of, of creative it has it has some sort of I think it has some sort of reverence for the old or building on it or stand, you know standing on the shoulders or evolving right. but you know even even outside of art you know when, when we're talking about like if it's a if it's a creative business solution mm -hmm. you know what to me what that really means is it's, it's a new way of thinking or a new way of handling so for yeah for me personally when I'm, I'm making music, I guess I, I get I get that from asking questions. You know, uh, my music doesn't sound very original when I don't ask enough interesting questions of myself. You know, when I don't when I don't think outside of the box. You know, so if I if I if I do everything that I've been taught to do and everything that the tutorial videos and, and the books I've read and the gurus, I, you know, if I do everything that they're saying to do, I'm not going to have anything creative. I'm not going to have because I'm not I'm not I'm not really creating anything i'm just i'm just regurgitating exactly uh what, what, what i've been taught you know so again then right. then you land in the same old same old you know it, it might be something that's high quality but if it's high quality that's done it's already kind of been done 
you know, then you're not really innovative. So, I mean, and, and there's something to be said for being the, the definitive. You know, I think I think there are some artists, you know, today that don't really like break new ground. It's just they're, they're just doing a really good job of, of doing those old genres again, you know. So there might be like a, you know, up and coming blues artist and, and, and the blues is still the blues. Maybe they're not really innovative. They're just doing it so well. Um, but yeah, for me, it's, it's when I start to ask questions, you know, well, what if I did it? Uh, you know, what if I did something while I'm producing in an unorthodox way? What would ha- what, what would happen if I did this? You know, so, and it's good to have that old foundation to 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 build off of. But but sometimes it's it's breaking the rules in, in new and interesting ways. Um, like one example is, is the band Tame Impala. I think very often, you know, I've watched videos on you know how to recreate some of his sounds with guitar pedals, and the the, the order that he puts the guitar pedals in is a, is it's they're you know very non-traditional you know they'll, they'll, they would normally tell you okay you know this effect goes before this effect goes before this effect but if you mix them up you change the sound completely you know and some people would call that wrong but right. if you can make something sound good out of a tone that everybody else says is, is wrong then you know and you do, and you do it in an artful uh, in, you know uh, in, a, in a way that's, that's that's pleasant to people and they can resonate uh, then. And that can be a new, a new, fresh thing. And I think that's that's what people are looking for. You know, they're, they're, it's it's inspiring to hear something where you're like, oh wow, I, you know, I've never heard anything like that before. It makes me, you know, a new piece of music that, that's innovative, innovative and creative. It can make us feel a new, a new feeling, or 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 we relate to that song in a new way. So I think there's a newness there. Um, you know, sometimes creativity is is just happy accidents. You know, like like um, like Phil Collins in the '80s. You know, I've heard this story of uh, his his iconic drum sound was actually from one of his. Uh, assistants or you know one of the one of the other guys in the studio they they actually programmed the compressor on the on the drums Mm -hmm. incorrectly and it gave it that really loud like if you've ever heard that one really iconic uh phil collins song where the drums come in really hard Mm -hmm. you know that's that's a that's a that's a compressor uh, effect and so up until that point everybody said no 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 that's that's wrong and that's not how you use compressors and phil collins was like no that sounds really interesting let's use it um so yeah uh pushing the boundaries asking asking interesting questions you know looking at things in new ways which which again you know i think i think it involves asking questions you know what is what does this mean to me what does this mean to culture what does this mean to everybody else what does this mean to music what would happen if i did this or you know what should we think about this i i've heard artists um that have to you know listen to their favorite influences all over again and kind of get in the zone of things or mm-hmm. they they have a tendency to just start playing around with sounds in order to get yeah. things moving for them. I mean, what works for you? How do you dip into that concept of, of being innovative? Well, I would say as a DJ, I wouldn't even consider myself super innovative or super creative. Now, I would play very innovative tracks and I would play very creative tracks, but that that was more to the credit, you know, so I just I just felt like I had, you know, as a DJ, you know, I, I, I did play in safer, more traditional kind of ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would, I would definitely pick things that I that I thought had a had, had a creative interest or they had that creative spark or they were very innovative and very interesting. But yeah, to answer that same question as a producer, yeah, it, it, it can come just from curiosity you know so sometimes you know a weird idea will pop into my head and you know earlier in my producer career that might have been an idea I would dismiss because I wanted to know okay what's the right way to do things and what's the wrong way to do things and then when you get to a certain level you realize like there is no wrong or right way and that that can be pushed to an extreme I mean um, you know you look at um like Jackson Pollock paintings, you know, there were some people that said that's not that's right. not art. You don't you don't have any talent. You know, you're just mm-hmm. splattering paint. But I think just his paintings alone, you know, were artistic because they asked that question. They they forced us to ask that question. Well, what is art really? You know, right? Um, and when I was when I was younger, like 20 years ago, um, when they still had CD stores, I listened to a CD that was it, it was a genre that was called Japanese noise. And to most people, that, that would just be terrible. And it's still not something I would ever really enjoy. And it really was just distorted tones changing and, and um, 
it, it begs the question, what is art? Does art does art require talent or does it just require uh, creativity and pushing boundaries? You know, I, I think it's harder. It's definitely harder to market, you know, when people can't see or hear or feel the, the talent and, you're, you know, people are a lot quicker to dismiss something when they're like, oh, well, I could have I could have done that. I, I have two abstract paintings in my office at work. And um, when I when I brought them in, my secretary at the time, she was like, oh, well, that's not really art. Like anybody could do that because they were they were abstract. You know, mm-hmm. they were they were they were closer to the Jackson, Jackson Pollock style. But I still felt something when I when I saw them. So maybe there wasn't a ton of talent required or maybe there was a talent in picking the colors, you know, mm-hmm. um, it's, it's hard to say, but yeah. So innovation to me is 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 really just being curious about well, what would happen if I if I tried this. You know, I, sometimes I, I I can compare producing to being like a mad scientist. You know, I'm I'm pouring chemicals together just just to see what happens. You know, and maybe nine times out of ten it's a disaster. But that's the great thing about being a producer is that, you know those nine times out of ten you can just delete them. I don't really consider myself like experimental is its own genre Mm -hmm. but i think sometimes experimental goes so far that it's not accessible at all and i I, so i still like my music to be somewhat accessible and somewhat conventional but but have some little experimental things in there somewhere for for people to latch on to as far as like labeling is concerned do you are you refrain from labeling yourself and if that in that respect or do you do you describe your music in ways where you would use adjectives instead in order to describe it or maybe even influences in order to describe what you actually sound like. Before I kind of took a break from DJing or gave it up or whatever, mm-hmm. um, it was a lot easier. You know, I could I could say, oh, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm techno or dark techno or tech house or dark tech house or, you know, so it was a lot easier for me to say these are the genres um, that I DJ in and these are the genres that I produce in. But in the last three years, it's it's my sound has went all over the place a lot more. I've kind of let the songs go wherever they want. I, you know, I think it's, sometimes it's easier from song to song or, um, you know, maybe even like album to album or release to release to say, okay, yeah, this is a little closer to this style or this is a little closer to that style. Yeah, so I, I am trying to be creative a little bit more. I guess, yeah, I guess trippy. I mean, I don't, I don't think, I don't think <laughs> trippy is a job. I mean, maybe. It's, yeah, I mean, psych- it's psych- however psychedelic you want. Like, yeah, so I, I, I think that I'm a little harder to, to pin down within the last three or, you know, or pigeonhole, you know. Right. So, yeah. Right. Well, I see, and and the, that's why I bring this up is because of that the the concept of being placed in a box where you're suddenly where you suddenly feel you're not able to refrain from if you were placed in that genre a lot of mm-hmm. artists feel that way they're like okay well you're you're in a place me you're in a pigeonhole right yeah. the concept for me the, the my creativity and suddenly you know you you decided to call me a pop artist mm-hmm. and now it's like well what maybe my last album was pop but right. me as an artist i'm trying to evolve and what if i'm trying to appeal to the mass and at this point everyone seems to be going electronic now instead so what if i want to take my pop music into an electronic right. feel and then you're going to yeah. look at my next album and are you still going to call me a pop artist yeah so it's yeah. so a lot of what i've noticed is a lot of artists tend to refrain from that concept and that's why i ask because um, your music it, it does vary in style um, and, and obviously that 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 develops it's a lot more power to you because you have a lot more of that flexibility you'd be able to dip into various numbers of styles um, without having to feel constricted mm-hmm. I mean I, I I think I like giving myself that liberty of, of being able to to try out different things I you know I, did, I didn't give myself that freedom before because I said you know before I said oh well you know I have to I have to identify with one genre right and I think you know that in a, in a way that makes it easier for the listeners, you know, because sometimes listeners, you know, they'll get they'll get a taste of something and then they want more, mm-hmm. you know. And I even one of my one of my friends who, you know, he had like a hit record and it was kind of like a hit record in Germany. And some of the people that were more experienced, they were like, no, you have to keep making this sound for a while until you're really known for this sound. And then you can experiment or, you know, change styles if 
you want. But right now, because you've kind of hit with this style, people are going to want more of that exact same style. And I think it kind of debilitated him a little bit because he was having a hard time, you know, making more music that was exactly the same as the music he'd already made. You know, he was he was really trying to kind of almost copy something that he had already done. And uh, I think for some of us, that's really hard, you know, because the, sometimes the songs, they, they have a mind of their own. You know, the art, it has a mind of its own, you know, especially for for instrumental styles you know it can, it can change really rapidly you, you know I, I don't always have a crosshair or a you know a direction um, I mean sometimes I do when I'm working for somebody else mm-hmm. and doing commissioned work or composing for somebody else on, a, on their project but but yeah when it's when it's just me I, I don't always know where the song will end up and it, it seems like it kind of has a mind of its own and I keep kind of experimenting and randomly trying things until I get something that's interesting and I'm juggling I think too between you know you don't want to you don't want to push the envelope too much because then nobody will understand it it won't be accessible it'll just seem crazy maybe you know or or misunderstood yeah um. all right so let's tell where our listeners can tune into your music so yeah i i I have uh i have an instagram i have a uh, facebook and i have youtube YouTube. So actually, yeah, if you're more into the DJ stuff, I, I actually have some older older mixes on there. But I've kind of like abandoned the SoundCloud a little bit because I've heard, you know, people aren't as sure that SoundCloud is going to survive for whatever reason. Okay. Like the profits aren't as good or the, you know, there's not as there's not as many people on there or, you know, the business model is, is failing or, some, you know, something like that. So... And I think it, as an artist, it, 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 especially if you don't have like a team behind you, and I, I do not have a team behind behind me, you know, I've heard more and more that it's better to, you know, juggle fewer social, like, you know, a few years ago, they were saying, oh, be, be everywhere, you know, be everywhere on the internet, have, you know, have one of these and one of these and one of these and one of these. And that now people are starting to change gear and say it's, it's way better to just be on a few socials and try to gain a bigger following in those and try to master those. And, and so um, I'm really concentrating more uh, the most on YouTube and, and Instagram right now. It, you know, when I do post things on Instagram, it just gives me the option to post on my Facebook page as well. Correct. Yeah. So that's, 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 that's usually just what I do. So I don't, I don't monitor Facebook. And even when I do the ads, I do the ads on Instagram and not on Facebook as much. Um, I also have my own um, band camp so that's just christopher thomas richardson.com that has the links for for everything else uh that also has the links to the city of mist soundtrack most of my other stuff you can you can listen to you know for free on spotify or all right and then as far as event details do we ever look forward to catching a, maybe a live session from you on social media um i'm i'm such i'm i'm so critical and such a perfectionist <laughs> that i really i typically avoid the lives yeah um, um, I, I mean, I, maybe I, w- I will do that someday. I think I think the lives are doing really well right now, so I, I think I'm kind of shooting myself in the foot by not doing it. I'm not taking advantage of that. For me personally, as a perfectionist, I prefer, you know, even when I do um, like a gig, you know, with with my live gear uh, over here and stuff like this, or, you know, I got a, got a synthesizer right there and another synthesizer over here. Um, I prefer to do like 10 takes, you know, or even 15 takes um, and, 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 and give people the one that I feel like I'm the, the happiest with, you know? So mm-hmm. I, I like, I like that. I like doing it again and again and again until I get the the result that I think is, you know, the most interesting and the most creative. And, and even, even when I was DJing, you know, I, I think I would do well most of the time and I got compliments on my DJing, but I, w- I was still just terrified the whole time. So I think these days, I, you know, even if people want the live, I'm kind of being a little more selfish and saying, well, you might want the live, but I, I, <laughs> I don't. I think it's normal. I I think it's very normal for someone to be hard on themselves or to be, if anything, be hard on their own craft, right? Especially Mm -hmm. before you execute it out into the world. So, um, you know, some are perfectionists like yourself and others say, hey, you know what, fuck it. And then they decide Mm -hmm. to like, you know, execute (laughs) something on the whim for the sake of saying, hey, you know what, let's just fly with it and see what people say. I think there are obviously pros and cons to that concept. Sure. Uh, but other than that, at the very end of the day, what you're doing is you're still executing, you know, your craft and 
I mean, this is why you do it, right? I mean, you do it because you love it. Would you be able to provide um, any form of advice uh, that you've learned yourself that you wish you would have known a long time ago uh, oh, wow. to other to other DJs or producers um, that are currently, you know, just starting off? Yeah, I, I, I would say that, you know, relationships are more important uh, and communication skills and all that are, are more important than I realized 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would definitely tell my younger self, you know, work more on relationships, keeping relationships, maintaining relationships. You know, very often when I was younger, you know, if I, if I would get out of a bad relationship with like a crazy girl or something like that, I, I, I would just change my number uh, and, and um, you know, or, or, you know, sometimes you get a new phone and you lose those numbers. Right. Um, you know, so don't don't lose touch with people. I mean, I think it's easier now with social media. So a lot of those people I lost, I lost them a long time ago before social media was that big or, or some of those people never were, you know, they, they always just refused social media forever, you know, mm -hmm. but, um, but yeah, I've lost contact with people throughout the years or sometimes, you know, you get, you get in a little bit of a disagreement with somebody and then you don't talk and you kind of let that relationship fester. And now that I'm older and a little more mature, I try, I try harder to salvage those relationships because they're valuable on a, on a personal level, they're valuable uh, on, a, on a career level. So yeah, relationships, communication, you know, try to try to be the bigger person, you know, try to put other people first within reason, you know, don't be a doormat, definitely have boundaries. But but if you're if you're a caring, giving, likable, you know, dependable, friendly person, you're going to have a lot easier time getting people to help you. And for the most part, pe people that make it, um, I've come to realize they don't they don't make it alone. They have, they have a team, you know, the more I've, the more I've read about the marketing and the promotion, you know, even if it just seems like one DJ who's also a producer, or something like that they they always there's always a whole crowd behind the scenes helping right. to push that that person out there because not only do they believe in you but they all you know they also like you and you've helped them with their things mm. so sometimes it might seem like a waste of time you know you're like oh i gotta worry about my music career i don't have time to help my friend but if you help your friend today then your friend will you know you'll get it you'll get it back tomorrow you know so um but but also yeah make sure you are choosing the friends who are gonna scratch your back in return so that would be number one yeah the relationships and the communication are very important I, I never I never studied the promotion and the marketing side of things uh, as, as much as I should have you know I always just expected like oh I'm gonna I'm gonna find a manager or I'm gonna get picked up by a label or I'm gonna get discovered like as, if long, as long as I just keep practicing DJing or I keep practicing producing th this this magic is gonna happen you know and I think that's what movies kind of make you think you know like oh if you just if you just try really hard and and learn your craft and somebody's going to realize that you're that you're talented and I, and I think at this point you know I definitely I think I got really good at DJing and at this point I feel like I'm really good at producing but I don't I don't have that team of people behind me marketing for me because I haven't done a great job of maintaining the really you know, like, you know I have some people that are that are willing to help me out but a lot of people are just busy you know with with their own thing and then I end up busy with my thing so I have friendships but I but I don't have a lot of those like best buds where I'm bending over backwards for them every day and they're bending over backwards for me every day because I, I wasn't as good at the relationships and stuff in the past. And so I'm having to do a lot of the marketing and the promotion stuff on my own or or, or out of pocket. And I and I wish that I would have, you know, learned the industry more as I as I went. I wish I wouldn't have put off having the socials for as long as I did and maintaining this, you know, because I think I would have a lot more of a following now than I do if I had been maintaining a lot of those socials all along and, and keeping all those old friends all along and also when you do get a fan you know and you and you have the opportunity you know really take care of that fan and and and, and get to know that fan you know a lot of people think oh well you know bigger artists don't do that you know and it's like well you're not a bigger artist Right. You know, you're not a bigger artist yet. Don't just assume that your art is going to be so interesting to your fans that that's going to be enough for them. Um, you know, that might work for some of your fans, but you're going to be missing out on a lot of other ones that need a, a story or they need a relationship or they need a connection. And so if you're smaller, you have an opportunity to do that. You know, and it, doesn't, it doesn't mean you have to be their best bud, but, you know, if, if they give you a compliment, don't just say thanks and move on, you know, like... 
talk talk to them about oh well what you know what other artists do you like or where are you from or you know at least you can you can get to know them for a couple minutes you know and I think this you know I, even Paul McCartney you know I don't think he ever planned it this way but I've heard that when he you know when people ask him for a photograph he wants to have a tiny conversation with the person instead mm. you know or, or in addition to the photograph now for him that's he actually does that for himself because he doesn't want you know he doesn't want to feel like oh he's just this piece of meat that you're taking a photograph with right you know so he want he want he would rather have that tiny connection with each of his fans even even if it's only 60 seconds or two but that might be part of why the Beatles became so famous is because of that time that Paul McCartney took the time and gave you two minutes even though maybe he didn't have the two minutes you know he wanted he wanted to know your name and shake your hand now more than ever right it, it, it definitely makes a lot more sense uh, not for the sake of yeah. exactly right and yeah. so little by little beginning to open up as far as the, the nation is concerned because of the pandemic um still people have found other ways to be able to communicate online and whether it's just the person themselves or or, or it's an artist um, or it's in the school district you name it right we're all finding different ways to keep that communication going it's, it's very human nature to be this yeah. way um, but at the same time you know talk about marketing on a different level for the sake of knowing that if we didn't have the capabilities we currently have now you would have gone the route that you're talking about which is very natural but people see that as so basic i think they tend to overlook it and so mm -hmm. the concept of developing yeah. that relationship as basic as it may sound it's so critical and it's so crucial mm -hmm. right so yeah. once you develop that relationship with that one person that suddenly was given that amount of time with someone that they look up to and right. their life was changed dramatically right. for the sake of them being a, a, a stellar fan and from there mm -hmm. it's you know going back into the technology we have now what makes you think they're not going to begin to not only share your stuff online but then right. that that stuff goes viral because their friend shares it and then their other friend shares it and i mean the concept of going viral is, is so it's a domino effect well it makes more of a statement now more than ever i've noticed and this is just to complement the concept of, of, of people making statements because you know they feel a certain way, for example, Black Lives Matters or a certain mm -hmm. situation occurred and they feel that this needs to be justified in a certain way, allow that to go viral and suddenly it just gets fixed. And so because of that power, more than ever relationships are a lot more critical. And this is Christopher Thomas Richardson, not to be confused with the American Idol singer. He's a DJ and he's a producer, now a composer. Once again, you're watching Guac is Extra, creative culture at its core. Have a great night and guac on. Stay safe, stay safe and wear a mask. <laughs> and there you go.